It's a truly rainy day again, and we return to the LMAO series, episode number 16. I'm on my way to the churchyard to pick my better half of the work. She's been digging graves again and doing all kinds of serious stuff, bringing bells and singing Metallica for whom the bell tolls, that one will whom, that is the actual song, in case you didn't know. Anyways, uh, this is LMAO, uh, episode number 16 in the total series, and uh, the final episode in season 2. We've been traveling all over the universe with our two seasons so far. In the first season we were mostly indoors and uh, refreshing memories. For example, in the first episode, I basically just landed in like I had fallen off a tree and introduced the stuff that I work with and that I like to play with and that gives me uh, ideas that help my uh, awareness emerge in its natural environment. So I basically just uh, sat myself in and took it as it comes. Then in part two of LMAO in the first season, uh, I gave some greetings to my uh, old friend who had had a birthday and uh, I think I sung, a, yes, I sung a birthday song and some other uh, fairly wacky and loony tunes as well. Basically orienting myself to the routine course of life. Then in the third episode we were outdoors in my favorite place, the Happy Forest place. Uh, where we were talking about uh, some medieval mystic films about the union of sun and moon in a divine fusion, etc., all kinds of uh, weird things that people don't talk about in the middle of the night when everyone else is fast asleep or slow asleep, depending on their nature. Oh, look, there are horses again. There's a man shivering in cold, but I like the horses a lot. Sorry about the flicker comes with the rain and the wipers got to wipe it clean out then. Anyway, got to keep rushing a little bit. Got the lady waiting in the rain and she'll be pissed off if I'm stuck recording all kinds of crazy stories along the way again like I sometimes do. Take a right turn, then take a left turn. Remember to say hi to the horses between the left and the right. And then when you turn left, the road goes low. So, back to the stories. We were in the middle of nature, in the happy forest place. And then in episode 3 and then episode 4, uh, we return somewhat deeper into all these old uh, hymns and songs, whatever that we sang about and contemplated on. Got a lot of that stuff in the memory banks, but I don't really use it much because I'm so shit tired of religion because people always take it as some sort of a naivistic play with uh, dolls or idols or whatever and uh, entirely fail to seize the actual uh, meta substance that is present in all of those symbols. They are all nature born, self born, society born, universe born and uh, harmony born interactions in a bilateral balance and that is all and they in different times and places, they are some different shapes, but uh, 
people always forget the point eventually. The narrative becomes the be all and end all, and the actual underlying uh, meta fabric or the archetypal variables of awareness go exactly like that. They just fly off the. Still recording. Try to stay on the road. Oh, here you see. It was such a sightseeing tour today. There's the mound of the elf king. This is where we heard the Elvis sleeps. Oh yeah. Do the jailer house of rock because the elf king is alive again. So that was the anyways the elf mound. That was part five. That was a four-parter, which uh, may have uh, led some of you to worry about my uh, mental health, as you usually do when you don't really care to follow up on the timeline that goes up and down and that uh, gives context to all things, because nothing exists in a vacuum and nothing is said in a vacuum, and sometimes things are said and roles are taken in order to illustrate something. And when we publish things, we routinely uh, assume different characters in order to uh, have a dialogue, especially if it happens to be so that no one in the audience really cares to have a dialogue besides some uh, obi dooby lonely my uh, heva heva one-liner comments that don't really advance any kind of, uh, you know, I'm more accustomed to the sort of uh, dialectic methodology uh, uh, used in uh, uh, Plato's and Aristotle's Academy, for example, or uh, with the uh, seers and uh, philosophers uh, of ancient India, both on the Hindu and the Buddhist side of the uh, apparent divide. Uh, they're more along my uh, line of dialogue, and uh, of late I've been particularly fond of what's, what happened in the uh, golden age of Islam, where uh, the foundations of most of our uh, modern Western science were laid. They were the precursors to uh, Renaissance. You had a lot of uh, uh, eminent scholars, intellectuals, philosophers, uh, visionaries, uh, that for the first time in the world are around the earth, uh, eight, nine, hundreds, uh, etc. Uh, they had at their access, scriptures both both from the east and the west. For the first time in the uh, coalescing history uh, of the uh, present human civilization, uh, was it possible to analyze texts uh, from all over? Uh, they acquired and translated uh, mathematical, astronomical, uh, philosophical, religious, etc. texts uh, from India and China, for example, and uh, as far as their uh, agents uh, and their explorers could reach and bring back something uh, useful, uh, so far the scope of their knowledge uh, would reach, and from just that far they would syndicate uh, whatever uh, that was uh, valuable. Therefore, uh, in the Quran, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace, uh, said uh, that in this world uh, there are only two things that are dear to me. And uh, what are those two? First of all is, of course, uh, that which is dear to Allah or the dear to the uh, one uh, that, that, that is all uh, and that is uh, beyond definition as the superstructure uh, of all that is uh, and that gives all things their mediating uh, spin and sustenance so of course anything that fulfills that principle in a greater uh, or lesser capacity uh, that one uh, is worth uh, loving. Like for example, uh, we have the axis of the planet, which is a fairly useful thing if it weren't there. 
with a particular kind of walls like that, uh, we would be experiencing such fierce weather that uh, no human life would be sustainable on this planet. Uh, one planet on axis. Go to a much more micro level, take a humming top, you know, the sort of things that children spin. Spin and uh, there is a discus and an axis going to it. Uh, and you give it a spin, and for as long as it spins, it stays erect in its intended purpose. And as long as soon uh, as the stasis uh, takes over uh, and the dynamics ceases, uh, the humming top is dead. Uh, likewise, for a human being, uh, as soon as finally uh, the mediating current of life uh, is so distraught and so out of harmony uh, that stasis takes over, then the bodily functions begin to shut down and uh, the bodily vessel is declared uh, dead because it has expired past its uh, interdependent usefulness. So, we came to all that from the Islamic Golden Age where they took great inspiration uh, in statements like uh, great is he that created the uh, earth and the heavens or conceptualized or conceived or contained the meta pattern thereof that is however you wish to express it more or less uh, anthropomorphic terms uh, Islam still has some cleansing to do as far as uh, removing the residue of human attributes that they still uh, attribute to Allah due to their traditional semantics that derive from uh, uh, one and a half millennia back when a different kind of uh, language of abstraction uh, faithful to the same uh, experience uh, would have been altogether incomprehensible. So, Allah or the we we or the who who or the ye ya or the ya wa, it doesn't really matter what you call. Call the who a who a o a o a a a ye a ye a o a o a o, the alpha and the omega of all things. In different cultures, people have uh, different preferences of expression and it doesn't really have as long as the principle uh, and the dynamism are the same it really, really doesn't matter at all what you call them as long as the uh, reality of the experience is unified because that which is directly seen uh, Dharmam to Saksha Bhagavad Pranitam, for example, it is said in the Indic scriptures. And that Dharma, or the uh, Dharma means Trita, uh, that which is uh, established firmly, which means the uh, root patterns of existence, the principle, the laws of nature, uh, the laws of interaction, the unavoidable realities that govern. <coughs> everything that we do in this world. Uh, those dharmas are uh, granitan, uh, mm, particularly uh, conjugated or uh, um, principally established uh, by the uh, possessor or the originator. Uh, of the said powers itself, which is obviously you have a big bang and bounce outward and first time in space, and of course the, what was before uh, those uh, patterns that followed from the reaching of the original symmetry, uh, the root uh, unified force, the universe, uh, and the coming of the three forces, uh, and then the coming of gravity that made all things uh, fall outward at a much, much slower rate uh, from the initial quick burst forming into the universe we know right now. So 
So anyway, uh, those kinds of patterns uh, are established from the source outwards, and they are all derivative. And uh, I have a lot more.